Hey guys, how's it going? Welcome to this week's weekly recap video. I'm gonna answer questions from last week's videos and we are just gonna jump right in today. There's no other business I need to talk about, which feels weird. Um, but the first video was spray painting container, spray paint container makeover. Uh, in that video, I took our four barn pots, four pots that we have out by our barn that we've had out there for the last three or four years. And I gave them a little bit of a makeover with some spray paint. I spray painted them black and I love the results. I got a hold of some beautiful boxwood topiary spirals um, and some light yellow pansies and it just looks so classic. I don't know, I really like it. First question is from Kathy. Love how they turned out. Did you just use one heavy coat of spray paint or two coats? It was basically just one thorough coat. I am noticing though, Erin went out and took some pans, you know, some um, video of them after I was done. And I told them you can't use that pan. There was one of them that showed like a totally huge spot that I missed. So I need to go back out there and just patch it up a little bit. And that's why it's always good to buy a little extra paint um, in case you miss some areas. Uh, Kim said, will you have to retouch the pots with a fresh coat of spray paint every so often? Yes, I will probably touch them up once a year at least, if not twice. Um, and if you keep it up like that, it does not take very long and you can do a very light layer just to patch anything. Uh, Laura said, I live in Texas where it gets really hot and for a long time I, I've wondered if black containers would work here. Have you noticed them being a problem for you? No, I've never noticed them being a problem for us. It could be because we are very consistent about watering. They're watered every single day. I mean, it gets upwards of like 108, 110. Sometimes it's even been a little bit hotter than that on occasion. And our pots do really well. And I think that's just because of the daily watering. It keeps our roots cool and such. Uh, Kelly said, Love the black on the pots, but I was wondering, will the, these evergreens burn on one side like the others did? So was it two years ago? I can't remember how many years ago. I did the North Pole Arborvitae spirals in those pots and they did not fare very well. And I don't know, like they all burned on the same side. And I don't know if it was because of like wind exposure or wind and sun exposure or whatever. Uh, maybe it was the heat bouncing off the barn, but um, they did not do very well. I think also it would, had to do with the amount of water we were giving, giving the containers based on the annuals that I had down below them. And you know, maybe that wasn't compatible. So I think it could have been a mixture of different things. Boxwoods tend to do a little bit better for me in containers. They're just a little bit more uh, adaptable, I guess, to being treated a little bit differently. So I'm hoping for the best because those were not cheap to buy. I gotta make them survive. However, North Pole Arborvitas do really well for us in the ground, like super well for us. Our hedge is just, it's trucking right along. It's growing like crazy. We're about ready to plant a whole bunch more on the new property and I couldn't be happier with them in the ground. And they've had to go through a lot. We planted them when it was 104 degrees outside. And then that winter, was that the winter we got 52 inches of snow? Did we? Plant them, or was that the following? We planted them the year before the snow. We plant, so they had to go through the 52 mm -hmm. inches of snow and they survived. So they're a great plant. Calvin said, do I see flowering fruit trees in the back? Yes, you do. There are six fruit trees back there. There's two apricots, two peaches, a plum and a pear. And those are all gonna be going out in our new garden on the new property. The Jilly Killy. I like how you decide and just get it done. If it's me, I'd sit on it for months before executing. How do you just go for it? You know, I am kind of both ways. Um, there are a lot of things, especially things like paint, painting pots. It's such a, like a small thing to me, like just to paint the pot. If I don't like it, I can paint it again. Um, and I've had those for so long that I feel like, you know, I've got a lot of good use out of them the way that they came to me. And if I don't love them black, I can live with it for a season and I was planning on replacing them anyway. Um, so in that case, I didn't really have a ton of fear about painting them. I always, I always have a little bit. I mean, there's always a little bit of trepidation. Trep, is that right? The word, right word. There's always a little bit of that when I fly into a project that's going to change something. Like when we do a new area, in fact, this week, maybe even tomorrow, we're putting up a video of some of our projects we have going on right now. And one of them is a new pathway right behind me on the west side. And I, I did something in it that I, waff, I was nervous about. So you guys will see that and I love it. So oftentimes if you just go with your gut and just go for it, you'll love it. Uh, and then there's other times where it takes me a long time to execute, like planning out this new property, Aaron would have it all planned out and he'd already be executing on it right now. Um, for me, I like to take my time. I'm like, maybe we should just like look at it for a year and then decide what we want to do with it. So it just depends on the situation for me. 
The Wheel Me said, are you planning to paint your barn to match your house and chicken coop? Yes, hopefully as soon as possible. Um, we have some friends that are painters and we're hoping to get on their schedule sometime soon. We also need to get our house painted, but that's not in the cards this year. Dawn said, won't your hard water show deposits on the new color? They would if water was gonna be hitting the outside of the containers, but since I have drip run to them, the water's just gonna be on the inside. It'll be dripping on the top of the soil and going through the container and out the bottom and they're not near any grass sprinklers or anything, so there's gonna be no water that hits those containers, so we should have very minimal hard water issues on those. Joyce said, where did you get all of the burlap bags? So those are what our concrete comes wrapped in. Whenever you get a concrete load, like down at the garden center, I mean, I remember opening up pallet after pallet of just like burlap wrapped concrete because you know you have to wrap it well so it doesn't break. So I have kind of a stack of burlap sacks which come in so handy for a bunch of different types of projects. You could probably go anywhere that they sell concrete. You could probably go and sweet talk them out of a few bags because most of the time everybody's got like a stockpile of them sitting back somewhere. My parents do anyway at their garden center. Digs in the dirt Northwest Landscape Design said, what do you think? I think a fifth pot would look great to the far right between the door and the fence. And you are right. It would look amazing, but there is no room. And I saw that comment so much. That was like the, the biggest comment on the video was like, ah, I can't stand that there's not a fifth pot. Well, if you take a look at that, if I were to put one, I mean, there's no room in between the door and the garage. Um, I mean, it's just like very small. And then on the other side of the door, it's a walkway. And so I can't neck that down because we take carts and stuff through there all the time. So I'm just working with what I've got there. Next video was a fun and colorful miniature garden with a DIY pond. And I had some leftover floral resin from a, a past project and I wanted to try making a little pond for a miniature garden. And we got some fairy garden pieces in the mail. And so it was just a fun kind of distraction this last week to do something completely just, I don't know, just fun and whimsical. Honey Hive said, I have a challenge for you. When you can, can you do a fairy garden on a budget? Yes, I think that's an excellent idea. Maybe like a dollar store fairy garden challenge. What do you think, Erin? I could do that. I love that idea. Valerie said, any possibility you could put a supplies list of how you made the garden? I would love to duplicate it. So we usually try to to have as many of the things linked in a supply list down in the description or the comment section of each video. But this one was weird because I got the container down at the garden center, but that's not a type of container you can order anywhere online. It comes from a wholesaler. And then the fairy garden pieces were sent to us, so I don't even know where those came from. Um, and then the plants are so subjective to what you can get and have, sh I, you know, it's just, it was one of those things I just had a bunch of stuff on hand and just kind of like put it together. The only thing I could really link in that video was maybe like the resin, which I got at Joann's. So most of them, I try to do that if I have like a really direct line on how you can get it and it's not like really convoluted or confusing. Teresa said, I'm glad to know that I'm not the only adult that likes the thought of playing around with miniature items. It's such a relaxing thing to do. Yours is so cute, thank you. Thanks for sharing, hope you will make lots more. Does your mom make them too? So my mom has made fairy gardens. In fact, she did a class years ago when I was still working full time at the garden center. I mean like, like 10, 12 years ago, she did a fairy garden class where she had this huge piece of wood and like just did this whole fairy land. She doesn't do them very often though. Like I don't know that she's maybe done a fairy garden since then, maybe. She might hop on here and correct me if I'm wrong. Sylvia said, can we have an update of what's happening with the west side brick pathway and the fence building on the new property? Yes, you will get that update this week. Gail said, may I ask what you do with the fairy gardens? So I do a variety of different things. Oftentimes they'll sit here for a while and we'll enjoy them and I'll eventually take them apart because I want to use the plants in something else. And sometimes I use plants that are not appropriate for a fairy garden, obviously. Like if you ever see me put a supertunia in a fairy garden, I don't usually do that. But if you ever see that, like that supertunia will not be happy in a tiny little fairy garden. And so oftentimes I just make them to enjoy for a month or two and then I want to create something new or I want to use the bowl for something else, but I save everything. Um, so if, if I don't save it, I've got some uh, friends with some little girls who love fairy garden pieces. And so I'll sometimes give fairy garden pieces to them. I repot the plants. I actually even save the rocks. The only thing I can't save is if I use any mulch or any sand because I have a real hard time gathering that back out of the gardens, but I wash all the rocks and I reuse them. Uh, and so that's why a lot of times you'll see things like repeat. You'll see the same rocks. <laughs> like I have a little rock um, 
that has a hole drilled in it that I made into a little bubbler fountain once and I've used that rock in so many different fairy gardens. Uh, it's just a fun thing to do. So sometimes I'll take them down to the garden center too and I'll display them down there and I'll just give it to them and they can do what they want. They can sell it or they can tear it apart and use the pieces if they want. It just depends on the garden. Carol said, I have a question when you get an idea for a miniature garden, do you sketch it out at all and then make sure you have everything or do you just go look for things that go with your idea and start putting them together? Most of the time what I do is I've got like a piece or like in this case, I wanted to make the pond. And so I just based everything around that pond. And oftentimes I will gather a ton of stuff and I have absolutely no idea how it's gonna turn out. And I just hope for the best and I just plant, you know, it, it's, yeah, it can be a little bit nerve wracking. I used to not be nervous about it. Like when we very first started making videos, I like, I just put stuff together and didn't even care. <laughs> I'm like, yeah, I don't know. I've gotten a little bit more trepidatious over the years. I don't know why. Um, like I try to make sure that things are compatible, that are planted together, that I'm using like slightly more appropriate things in my projects um, than I used to. But yeah, I don't normally sketch things out. Normally I just kind of have one piece or one plant or one container that I just like design it, I guess, on the fly. And last question on that video was from Becky. How long did that actually take you? It took us a few days just because there were so many steps. Like it took uh, a couple of days for that pond to cure because I have it in our plant room and it's so humid up there that it took longer to dry than normal. Normally it's like 24 hours. And then I had to paint the bottom of it. And so that took, you know, 45 minutes. It takes 45 minutes to dry, but we just did that step and then finished it the next day. So we worked on it on three different occasions. I don't know how many hours altogether. Like, I don't know, maybe two to three hours altogether. Next video was how to install drip irrigation in raised beds. And in that video, I talked about our personal system because it's a little bit different. And then I also put together a system based on hooking it up to a faucet. So I showed you from faucet all the way to raised bed what pieces that I would put together to create a drip system in a vegetable garden situation or whatever kind of situation you're running drip to. Um, just because I'm such a visual learner, I was telling Erin, like I talk about it all the time, um, but I don't ever really show all the parts. And I, I think that would be helpful for me if I was trying to figure it out. So I hope it was helpful. First question. I'm just setting up a new kitchen garden with three semi-raised beds. Is it okay to have half inch tubes lying underground and letting half inch branches of the tube come up inside every bed of the, uh, from the underground? Yes, you can do that. The only issue I can see with that is that it might be harder if you have any leaking or any issues with your drip tubing, but that can happen. That can happen with our system. You know, we have a PVC pipe and then copper pipes coming up into each raised bed. And the fittings are probably a little bit tighter, a little bit more secure, so I'm not quite as worried about issues. When you're dealing with half inch poly, I mean, it's easy to nick it with a shovel or with your pruners or something like that. So that's the only issue I can see, but I think that's a great idea because it would hide it and then you wouldn't have to see it, which is always nice. Noreen said, I've, not, I've noticed you using a larger size drip tubing in some of your beds, half inch or one inch. I only use half inch versus the quarter inch you use in your veggie beds. Do you use a larger size tubing for thirstier plants? The only reason I use the half inch tubing or the reason I use it is because um, it goes a lot further and it supplies a lot more water. So we find that we can go between four and 500 feet with half inch tubing in a flower bed like per zone. Um, so you can go quite a distance and we have a lot of flower beds to do quarter inch. How far can you go, Aaron? Like 50 feet? Yeah, 50 like, to 100 tops. Yeah, tops, 50 to 100 with the quarter inch tubing. Um, so I would not be able to go near as far. Jean said, when planting vegetable seeds in trays, are you supposed to fertilize them after they come up or wait until they're in the ground? I always start fertilizing them once they get their first set of true leaves. So when they come up, you know, they get their first two leaves. Those are not true leaves. Um, and then they get their second set of leaves, which are actually their first set of true leaves. And once I see that, I start fertilizing at a half strength fertilizer. And so I was using the liquid start from a spoma, but I've switched to the liquid grow from a spoma because the spoma doesn't have the start fertilizer anymore. Um, and so... I'm using half strength liquid grow and it's working really well. C Booth says, I'm on city water lines and it's so much cheaper for us to run water in the evening to early morning. Would this be okay in a vegetable garden? What about flower beds? Absolutely. I think once you pick a watering time, just stay consistent with it and that's the biggest thing. And I do believe that a lot of people water in the like early morning or in the evening or whatever because you use a lot, lose a lot less to evaporation. Is that right, Erin? Like I've heard that. Like if the sun's not beating down on the water, like you lose, lose a lot less. But our nights are so windy here. Yeah. 
that we can't really There's like. There's so many variables. Yeah, there are a lot of variables. It's so windy here that we water usually during the day um, because yeah, at the night in the night a lot of it would be blown away. So anyway, I think it's totally fine though. I think just pick a time and be consistent. Jenna said you may have covered this previously, but I can't seem to find it. How do you construct your raised beds with the mitered corner? Is there a support inside? Do not do mitered corners in your raised beds. <laughs> do not do it. I did it because it looked really pretty in the beginning and I was going for pure aesthetics. There is an L bracket, like a long one that has two short sides that kind of holds them together in the inside, but wood, it gets water in it, it swells, it starts to warp. And so all of my mitered corners, most all of them don't match anymore. There's a gap in there. So I would just put your wood together like this, <laughs> not don't miter the corners because uh, yeah, over time, I think they can kind of start to pull away from each other a little bit easier. Dana said, what brand of drip supplies, hoses and couplers are you using? Where can it be purchased? We get a lot of our drip supplies from Home Depot. We use the brown drip tubing is Dig Corp. And I think like the couplers are too, right? All the brown cu couplers. Um, and then we use the black poly with the blue line that I showed in this video. We also get at Home Depot, but it's in a different section. It's not in the irrigation section inside the store. We find it outside in the garden center section. It's like the industrial, like the commercial landscaper kind of stuff. And I think it said centennial drip tubing on the, the tube. And there are specific blue couplers for that. So we get most everything at Home Depot. Joanne said, what do you think of a brick raised bed? Are there any downsides to it? I don't think there are any downsides to having a brick raised bed. I think that would be really pretty really pretty. Jason said another tip. You can take the end of your run of drip tubing and circle back to the beginning and connect with the T-fitting. That way you don't have to plug it and the pressure balances the whole run. Um, so that's actually what we do in all of our flower beds. We create a grid system and we always connect it back to itself because it just, everything works really well. But in the vegetable garden, I don't find it necessary because it's such a short run. I have so little drip tubing in each one of those beds that I don't find it to be an issue yet. I mean, it's something that I definitely keep my eye on all the time. And if I ever notice an issue, that's definitely a good thing to mention. So thanks, Jason, for bringing that up. Um, do you guys have a pressure reducer on that zone or is it all line pressure? We have a pressure reducer at the beginning of that zone. So I don't have to have one on every individual faucet in each bed. And last question from that video was from Jackie. Where did you get the cloches that are on the garden raised beds? I don't think those ones are from Gardener Supply. They are from Gardener Supply Company. I have two different kinds. There's like the wire cloches and I just, they came out with a new one this spring. I think it's new. I don't know. I just noticed it this spring, but they have that same wire cloche with an extender. So you can start with it small when your crops are little. And then once they get bigger, if you're trying to protect them from rabbits or things like that, you can put this extender and it makes the cloche bigger, which is awesome. So I haven't, I have them in the barn. I haven't brought them out yet. And then I also have some bamboo cloches that are really cool looking. Next video was trimming, fertilizing and planting more hellebores. And I feel like I, I think I did a very similar video <laughs> to this one last spring, um, but it's just one of those garden tours that I have to do every year. And so I um, just wanted to capture it. Plus, you know, I was planting some really pretty new hellebores that I wanted to show you. So first question was from Nikki. Have you ever thought about making a garden book? So we have thought about it. It's something that's still on the table at some point. It's not something I'm super interested in doing right now. We've been approached by several different publishers to maybe put something together. And I just, I'm just not there yet. There's just so much going on here that I want to focus on. I mean, with the addition of the new property, we have a lot going on there. I have Benjamin and I just like want to continue making videos how we're doing it now. I'm really happy with how things are going. And um, there's just a lot to focus on here and I don't want to get too much going on. Um, so it's something that might happen at some point, just not at this immediate time. Judith said, some of my hellebores are getting pretty thick. Can I divide and replant now? Um, you can, I, I really wouldn't. Hellebores do not like to be transplanted or divided that I know of. Sometimes they can get pretty finicky about it. You can though. I mean, you can absolutely divide your hellebores, especially if they're really old. It might rejuvenate them a little bit. I would probably do that in, uh, in the fall. I've never had to divide a hellebore. So you can tell I'm not like speaking on very much experience, but if you Google it and read around, some people will tell you to do it in September, October. Some people will tell you to do it mid spring. I wouldn't do it mid spring. Mine are blooming mid spring. Um, so, I mean, it's something that you can definitely do, but I, if you don't have to, I wouldn't. 
Caleb said, where do you buy your plant tone? So my parents' garden center carries plant, plant tone, and I know a lot of garden centers do. So I would check with your local garden center first. Um, I do know that some box stores carry the Asmoma products as well, so you might check there. You can order it online, but I know that's a little bit more of a, an, an expensive approach because shipping is just so much. What happened to the hellebores you planted under your Colorado blue spruce? They are still there. Most of them are still there. I think I lost one that I planted way toward the back, and I actually planted that one toward the back because um, it was the kind of weakest looking one. I don't think that one survived, but they're looking great. And Terry said, can you show us what the baby hellebore seedlings look like? I think I have some, but I don't know what to look for and I don't want to pull them thinking they are weeds. So as soon as this video is over, I will run out there and I'll take a little video with my phone and we'll pop it on the screen for you so you can see what my seedlings look like. Nancy said, question about fertilizing hellebores. You used plant tone today, but I think you used a different tone in a different video. I did, last year I used flower tone. I used holly tone on mine a few weeks ago and they're looking really good. So I'm wondering, does it really matter what you use? I think when it comes down to it, a fertilized plant is better than a non-fertilized plant. And these fertilizers aren't so wildly different that it's gonna be a matter of having success or no success based on what fertilizer you use. If you were to buy one of the tones, I would probably go with plant tone and in terms of like being the most wildly uh, usable, I guess is the right word. Uh, you could use that on anything, but like last year I used flower tone, it worked really great. I mean, you can use holly tone work, would work as well. Um, so I think you did a great thing. And yeah, I think the whole point is just making sure your flowers get a little bit of food to help them along the way. Rebecca said, could I grow hellebores in containers for now? Absolutely. You know, my parents' garden center, they have this little chalkboard right in front of their front door and my mom planted a bunch of hellebores around the chalkboard thing, um, like pole. It's a pole that holds the chalkboard up. So there's a planting reservoir below it. So she planted it full of hellebores and that was like three or four years ago and they are still rocking. Like they are looking so, so good. And she'll just pop like little super tunias in around them. It's crazy. They're like in the front of the store that gets usually quite a bit of sun. There's a little bit of pergola there, but they're doing really great. I put hellebores in containers all the time and they, they just do well. So yes, go for it. And last question was Angie said, it's a shame the flowers hang downward and we did need to pick each one of them up to see, to really see how beautiful they are. I wonder if there is a biological reason for this um, where they work in a hanging basket to be, to be better to enjoy the blooms. Uh, you know, there are a lot of different series now of hellebores that have upward facing flowers. So if that's something that you really want out of your hellebores, I definitely look into those. And I can't remember off the top of my head what series they are. I don't mind it at all because I feel like there's some magic in it there's some magic like waiting to be seen. And to me, like I love the look of like those gracefully drooping blooms. And I like a lot of times the back side of the petals have really interesting color as well. And they're so great for flower arranging because a lot of times like out the sides of containers, you want flowers that are gonna have like this graceful habit rather than like being rigid and you know, they don't like bend nicely. So I don't know, I really like it and it's just, it's one of those sweet magical things in the garden. But I also like blooms that face upward too and I can totally understand where you're coming from with that. But there are varieties you can get that will do that for you. Next video is planting a new variety of bleeding heart. I planted some pink diamonds dicentra, which is an alpine type dicentra that can handle full sun and it blooms all season long. And it's got the most beautiful leaves. They're like this, they almost look like parsley. I was looking at them earlier and I was just like, that's what they look like except they're blue. So they're really ferny, fine foliage that's really soft and really beautiful blue color. SR said, did I see those big self watering pots planted with tulips along that fence line? They look good. Um, yes, they are all sitting there. All the stuff is coming up. The only thing I lost in any of the containers, there's 14 of the containers all together. I planted iris in the center of one of them with tulips surrounding it and the iris all rotted out. I was kind of wondering when I planted them, they didn't seem like prime at the time when I put them in the, in the containers. So I wasn't really surprised about that. So I need to find something to put in the center, maybe some branches like curly willow or something like that. But they're all doing really great. A tiny bit of color is starting to show. So once they're in more color, I'll show you guys in a video. Jake said, have you seen the new for 2021 proven winners, Phlox and Dianthus? Can you get your hands on any of these to try all this season? So I did watch that video Walter's Garden put out. We will put it down below. You guys really should check these out because they're beautiful. There's a couple varieties of Phlox that, um, 
Like one is a real beautiful vibrant purplish color and then the other ones are really soft kind of pink. And then the Dicentra of course, um, Dicentra's, or I mean Di Dianthus, sorry, I'm like Dicentra on the brain. Dianthus to me, I'm not a huge Dianthus fan. I'm, I'm gonna be completely honest. I'm okay with Dianthus. I love Phlox though. Um, and I will try new things all the time and I'm hoping to get my hands on them. Usually I will be able to get a hold of some of the new things that they're gonna come out with if they have extras. So we'll see, hopefully I get some this year. Next question is from Kim De La Rose. What online website can I buy affordable plants and flowers and have them delivered to my house? Which I've seen a ton um, lately, that question a ton, just because of this weird time that we're in right now. And the only website that I'm really familiar with is the Proven Winners website. And a lot of the things that we show in our videos are from Proven Winners. As you guys know, we've worked with them for a lot of years. Um, their stuff online is not necessarily inexpensive because shipping is such a beast. It is so hard to one, handle the plants and package them in a way that are gonna arrive nice to you, but then shipping, as you know, is expensive too. And they only offer it really as a convenience. Um, they're not out there to compete with your local garden center and I will, um, they and myself will always recommend going local first. Um, but if you see something that you really like um, that we're showing in videos or things like that, definitely check out Proven Winners website and see what they have to offer. And I know they have lots of different sizes of things too. So you don't have to like get this huge, big, expensive plant. You can go with like a quart size or whatever, um, or four inch. So yeah, we'll link them down below. Will Massey says, how are you liking the forest compost as mulch? Is it fading quickly? It faded a little bit after the first like initial application of putting it down. Cause of course there was a lot of moisture in it and it was dark and it was beautiful and it grayed out a little bit, but it's not fading as much as I thought it would. Um, and so I do like the look of it. I, it's, jury's still out on whether or not we're gonna do bagged or bulk. Bulk is a lot of work. Like it is way more work than bagged mulch. And so I'm just kind of like, okay, time-wise, what are we gonna do here? Um, like I, my inclination is to go bagged because I know it will cause much less mess and much less time to get it done. So I don't know, we'll see. Denise said, right there with you in the garden, spent part of the day fertilizing, wasn't sure fertilizer, went with daylilies, uh, went with plant tone, was that right? Yes. Kay Caitlin is my name. What do you do with the soil you take out of the holes? So oftentimes you'll see me shovel out soil and put it in the plant can. And those go out to the new property, well, and which was previously our neighbor's property, and we just like spread out the dirt <laughs> in different areas out there. Um, so that's where it goes. Depop said, can you address the dieback on the evergreen behind you? Solutions, tips to keep it from happening. So the solution there is for the gardener not to plant things too close to it. I totally smothered the base of that arborvitae sp spiral last year. I planted some uh, vertigo penicetum right there. And there was also some salvia can't remember which variety, rock and deep purple or something like that, I don't know. But those annuals got so big and they shrouded the whole bottom of that spiral. I didn't really realize it, I like it didn't connect with me. So I didn't know until I was cutting back the annuals or getting rid of the annuals in the fall. And then I saw what had happened to the base. So I'm really hoping, I trimmed it up, doesn't look awesome. So I'm hoping to either plant more stuff to shroud the bottom or hoping for a little bit more regrowth. Danny said, what are those gorgeous variegated leaves behind you in the Dicentra video? Looks like some sort of tulip. It is, those are called Purissima Blonde. So they have almost like autumn frost hosta looking leaves, bright yellow uh, variegated uh, green with green leaves. And then the blooms are kind of this blondish color. Went in my parents' garden, they were a bright pure white. Mine are looking kind of blonde, which is what the name is. So they might age to more of a white because some tulips do that. I'm just kind of holding my breath. They just started to bloom. Lauren said, what are those trees I see in the background? Video soon? Yes, we will have a video for you soon on the new trees. The last video was full day of garden maintenance, pruning, planting, and making mint iced tea. We actually just posted that video this morning, so I snagged whatever questions were there. Jessica said, every Southern gasped when you said you don't like tea, bless your heart. I know you are from the North. Have you ever had sweet tea? I have had sweet tea, I don't really care for it, and I think I triggered a lot of people with how I made my tea. <laughs> Maybe that's my problem. Like you're not supposed to boil the tea bags and such. I've made it the same way forever. I've made it the same way my mom makes it. I don't know that she like simmers hers though. I think she just lets the water come to a boil and then puts it off the heat. And I let mine simmer for a second, but I love it. I love the ginger peach iced tea made that way. Aaron hates it. He's gagging like <laughs> right now. He loves the smell of coffee too, but he doesn't like the flavor of it at all. So I drink alone most of the time. Uh, Dylan said, I'm curious to know what you and Aaron decided to go with, truckload, mulch, or bagged? Oh, I just addressed that in the last video. Forgot I grabbed that question. Jury's still out. 
Linda said, which are the best butterfly bushes that can line a fence in a backyard? I live in Florida where it's extremely hot. I don't know what zone you are, but let me look. My favorite butterfly bush is the Miss Violet. Yeah, all of the ones I'm finding are only good up to a zone nine. So based on your zone, if you're higher than a nine, I'm not sure butterfly bushes will do. There might be other ones I'm not aware of though. So I would go to your local garden center and ask. That will be your best bet for good information. Brahma Chicken said, I love the blue fescue grass. Will you be transplanting it to a different part of your property? Aaron says no, but I might cut it back and transplant it to a different part of the property. I think that's the problem. I, said, I don't cut it back. And so you, all you see is like this kind of, like it could look much more fresh. I'm just not taking care of it properly. Priscilla said, good morning, Laura. Can I plant fruit trees and flowers or perennials in the same area? Not the same hole, but close by like around the tree. I would be careful. I mean, you can plant whatever you want by whatever you want, but when you have a fruit tree, you wanna have really easy access to maintain it. So you need to be able to get really close to it to prune it. You also wanna be able to get really close to it to pick the fruit. Um, so I would just be mindful of that. And I would probably plant my stuff out from underneath the canopy at least um, so that you have easy access to your tree. And the last question was from Miss Black. Why start all of those seeds under lights? Why not just put them in the ground or in a pot container? Uh, please explain in a video. So there are some seeds that need to be started inside. Like it's recommended to start them and then to transplant them out. And it's because they need warmer conditions in order to get started that they will not get outside until too late in the season. And then it takes the plant too long to grow and establish in order to really do anything during our gardening season. So those we start early. And then I have a whole list of seeds, a whole gob of seeds that I'm gonna be starting direct in the ground. Uh, outside. So there are a lot like bachelor's buttons and um, lots of zinnias, sunflowers, uh, cosmos, uh, baby's breath. I've got a huge list of stuff that will just be direct sown and sometimes that's better. So it's good to look on the back of the seed package and it'll give you instructions for both like whether you're starting inside or starting outside and then it'll tell you what which one is recommended. There are also some types of seeds that do not want their roots to be mess messed with like poppies and nasturtiums. So a lot of times those are better to direct sow outside. So you can learn a whole lot off the back of the package, but that's why I have a bunch started inside is because I'm getting a jump on our growing season and giving those seeds what they need in order to thrive until it's warm enough outside for them to be planted. And that does it for this week's videos. Thank you guys so much for watching. I hope you all have a really, really great week and have a lot of fun time to spend out in your garden. We'll see you guys in the next one. Bye.